last of the year. So we're glad to have them. Thank you for the mic. <laughs> so anyway, if you, if you haven't caught it, Tuesday, 7 p.m., leadership team meeting. Thursday, 6 p.m., praise band practice. And special service next week. And this after service today, we will have um, fellowship time downstairs where we will help celebrate Kay's 85th birthday. And today is her birthday, so happy birthday, Kay. We're going to sing to her, and my daughter Stephanie this week will be 17, and Kathy will have a birthday on the 29th. So let us sing to all the October birthday people. I asked Haley to help me, but you all join in, please. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Anyone else that is not on this list that has had an October birthday? No? We had no anniversaries in October, so we won't sing for that. <laughs> now, I asked Pastor Keith if he would do an opening prayer, so we're going to do that now um, before the call to worship and special music. Good morning. It's good to be with you on this beautiful fall day, and uh, I really do hope that yours is a blessed day. Pastor Sue has asked me to uh, share an opening prayer, and also uh, with that to update you on currently what is taking place over in Ukraine, particularly with uh, the family and the pastor that I've had a relationship with over some 20 years. The situation um, this summer was really quite, quite good. The church has been flourishing um, as a result of the different needs and concerns that have taken place in Ukraine. Uh, there has been a wonderful moving of the spirit and the people have been flocking, literally flocking, to, uh, to worship. Pastor Alex is, uh, is helping to lead efforts in terms of feeding and helping with, the, uh, with uh, the results of what has taken place over in the city of Chernihiv. In the last two weeks, what has taken place is that there has been uh, a renewed uh, there's been renewed bombing, drone strikes, taking life, and otherwise um, uh, bringing a halt to all city function. Chernihiv is the size of Lincoln, and so you can imagine a city of that size without water, without transportation, without uh, any utilities, and uh, in conversation with Alex just this past week, he and his family are choosing to stay. Pastors and families can leave, but he's choosing to stay. Other pastors are, in fact, fleeing the area, but he feels that the ministry is still strong and, and is calling him there until such time that they can no longer do so. So, uh, please keep Pastor Alex his wife, Tonya, his children, Sasha, Veronica, and David in your prayers as they continue to minister under very dire and extreme circumstances. And then remembering that this winter, the outlook is frankly quite bleak. Without those utilities and without that power, uh, they've been splitting a lot of firewood and just hoping they can stay in their home as a result. So it's that which we, and all of that which we entrust to the Lord and pray for an end to this war. It's madness, and uh, we pray that the people of Ukraine, and indeed those who are, who are bringing the war, might, uh, might be uh, led by God to uh, do otherwise. So, thank you, Sue. I hope that 
uh, is enough of an update. And if you want to ask me more about it, I'm happy to share with you. Okay? And oh, yes, I am going to pray. Thank you. <laughs> Please pray with me. I give you thanks, gracious God, for this opportunity that we can gather as your body to meet here today. We pray, O oh Lord, that your spirit be present with us and we open to your moving and your leading among us. Refresh us in mind, heart, and spirit, and may we find immense joy and hope in what we receive here today. It's a gift from you. Your grace prevails, and so may it do so in our lives for this service through this time we share together and as we are led from this place to go into the world. And so we give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Special treat is in special mood that you will sing. Oh, so we're going to sing um, two of Grandma Kay's favorite hymns today, kind of in honor of her. Um, during the first one, if during, we're going to sing all four verses of this, but if during the last, the very last chorus you want to join in, we would welcome that. Don't we all have your mics are on, maybe? Testing, okay. testing. Test? Okay. I Dad, think so. Is mine on? It Testing? Is. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> As 
Please stand and join me in the call to worship, and then remain standing for the opening hymn, please. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. Our souls yearn for the courts of the Lord. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Blessed are those who trust and praise you, setting their hearts on pilgrimage. Meet us here and remind us of your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Praise the Lord, our hosts of hosts. Amen. Please join in for Guide My Feet. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. Do we have some little people here? Oh, I see a couple coming. (laughs) 
Oops. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning. So today, I, I brought a word with me today. And this is the word that I brought. This is the word that I brought. Do you know what a home is? Well, a home is a place where you live at. And um, do you know what kind of places could be a home? You guys can feel free to help too. How about a house? Is a house a home? What other kind of places? <laughs> Some people live in a trailer. Yeah, a trailer. In a traveling home. Yeah, that's one. Castle. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, guess a castle. <laughs> an, an apartment. What about a cabin? cabin. Would that be a home? Or some people that live in tents. Well, besides people, do animals have homes? What kind of homes do they have? What do, what do birds live in? <laughs> or what do uh, bumblebees live in? <laughs> or what do turtles live in? Because turtles carry their own home with them. So yes, yeah, so there's bird nests, and then there's beehives, and there's turtle shells. I also have dens, and burrows, and caves. So besides all of those homes, we are all, we're all part of a, a, a home too. What home do you think that would be? What about God's home? Are we part of God's home? <laughs> and wh where is that home at? Where would God's home be? <laughs> well, God's home is all around us, and we are all welcomed and are wanted there. So besides that home, we also, uh, God's also part of us. He's, he, he's with us every day, and he's inside, at home inside us, and we take him wherever we go, and we do what he wants us to do. Okay, that's all I got today. <laughs> Thank you for coming up. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. We have another special song, and if you'd like to follow along, it's number 345, God Sent His Son. And same thing on this one. If on the last time when we sing Because He Lives, if you want to join in, please feel free. We're going to sing it through twice, so the second time. sent his son, they call him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. 
Thank you. This, that was beautiful. Does anyone have any joys or concerns to lift up today? weeks or it's about six months now and uh, talking like they're going to try to put him in the hospital and he can't be on that leg for quite a while mm. and they don't want him even putting any weight on it to try to get it to heal and his grandmother was a diabetic and she lost her legs so I hope that they can get it to cure and it's uh, and his wife runs the food bank down at the church down in Hickman and, uh, What's his name? Raymond Stouffer. And uh, I'd like to have prayers for him and his wife, too. She's going in for a knee replacement at the end of this month. And that's Joan Stouffer. Thank you. I was informed yesterday that Lonnie has shingles now. So yeah, that's why Chris and Lonnie are not here this morning. Um, please pray, it's pretty bad. They're giving him some antibiotics and we hope it calms down soon. Go ahead. I would like prayers for my granddaughter, Tiara. She was in an accident on Friday and has a broken foot and uh, needs prayers. Oh, and no. thank you for all the special music. As we pray, Tierra is okay, and her foot heals soon. That's horrible. Anyone else? We have such, go ahead. I want to lift up a joy that we have this, um, the funk and Cell and all shoemakers and, and all that family here today. Go yes, I, I want to express joy and thankfulness for having our family here to celebrate my mom's 85th. And she got to that point with a lot of grace and class, and I just want to be like her more and more. But uh, I just want to invite all of you down to have a cupcake or a cookie with us and some coffee or tea. Um, we are just very joyful to be together to have this opportunity and to be able to celebrate this. So thank you for allowing us to be here. We're glad to have Lori, Mary Lou's daughter, with us as well. She'll be here for a couple more weeks, I believe, right? Glad you're here. We're glad Janet's able to join us as well. Please keep John in your prayers and Janet. Um, John is at the Journey House until Wednesday. So we keep them in our prayers all the time, but we're so glad Janet could join us today. Anyone else? Let us pray. We praise you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your mercy your love, and your gift of joy you place in our hearts when we learn to surrender to your will and give our worries and our cares over to you. Help us daily in this, Lord, we pray. In our silence, hear the cares in our hearts that we wish for you to take from us. We ask for your healing touch on Lonnie, John, Jody. We're grateful that she has, is healing as well. We ask for healing for Raymond and Joan and Tierra, for all the people in Ukraine. We ask that you help us in this church as we gather and work towards transforming ourselves and our community of faith, ever trying to do your will and allow others to find Jesus as a result. Transform us and use us, Lord, for your ways are better than ours. Be with us even as we fail in continually living into our gratitude and rejoicing. Help us to abide in you and find our strength and our worth from you and not the world. 
We pray for those recovering from hurricanes, floods, fires, and disasters, for the needy and the war-torn. Thank you for the gift of Jesus, allowing your grace and your love to forever be felt within our hearts and in our midst as we gather to worship and praise you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we pray. Amen. Today's good news is Psalms 84, 1 through 6. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the cords of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God! Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Salah, happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of the springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. Thank you, Martha. In a couple of weeks, we'll be looking at another psalm regarding joy. And we'll focus on joy in the midst of the mundane or the trials of life even, singing a new song, focusing on no matter what is going on in our lives, we can find joy in the arms of Jesus. Today, though, we will focus on the connection between thanksgiving and joy, finding joy in our body of faith as a gathered people and what this could and should mean for us. The court of the Lord is a phrase that means in the presence of God. And what wonderful metaphors we find in Psalm 84, read to us by Martha. In the NRSV, it's titled, Joy of Worship in the Temple. It begins, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Now I know I find God's presence everywhere, especially in nature, but our house of worship it's a set-aside place for us to praise God together. It's a holy place that we come gathered as a body of faith and find refuge as we praise the Almighty together. The psalmist goes on, My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for the joy to the living God. This line reminds me of one of my favorite hymns, one we did for Jean's celebration of life service that she loved also. And Ziggy helped us lead a, um, the chorus at her graveside as the deer. I want to recite that chorus for you. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs for thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Back in biblical times, when the psalms were sung to God in worship, no doubt this psalm brought similar emotions up. It's indeed a testament to how our soul longs for, to be in awe and worship the living God with our hearts and our flesh as we sing for joy, as it states in verse 2. Then we come to a wonderful metaphor even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself. Michelle touched on that in the children's message. Jesus mentions how, we, how sparrows back in the day were meaningless. They were sold for less than a penny, it says in Matthew 10 and Luke 12. It was different than a penny, but you know. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than the sparrows. In biblical times, sparrows were plentiful, and they were often given to the poor for a meager meal. And to give this passage a bit of context, this is when Jesus is preparing his disciples to go out and evangelize, to tell others about the saving grace available to them that he is the long-awaited Messiah they had been waiting for. 
And after he tells them they will be persecuted for their faith, for this message. And in Luke, it comes after telling them to beware the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. In both passages, he tells them not to be afraid, that God will be with them and cares for them. And we see that here in this psalm. It says the swallow, another small bird still around today, can lay their young at his altar, meaning God will take care of them. Have you ever seen a small baby bird? They are totally helpless. They can't see. They just sit in the nest with their mouths open, waiting for mom to drop in some food for them. They can't fly. They don't go anywhere. They are helpless, and yet it says God will take care of them. This is priceless for us to remember. And the text in Matthew also says every hair in our head is numbered. God knows us. He values us. So we can find joy in knowing we are loved and worthy in the eyes of God. And I love that this Old Testament passage describes God as the living God. We serve, we praise, and we worship a living God. In verse 4, it says, Happy are those who live in the house, ever singing your praise. Salah. I learned in seminary, the salah is a form of saying amen. In some cases, though, it means rock or a precipice, like a hanging. And in its use in poetry, when the psalms are, it's often thought of as like a rest in a musical score. It's a moment indicated to pause and reflect. I think it's a lot like when I say amen when writing something about I really feel strongly about. So happy are those who sing to the Lord in his house. Amen. It might be a way to translate this for for us today. And to me, this is saying we should find joy as we praise God together. In this church, we should know that our worship pleases God, and it should also please us to do so. When we sing, when we lift up, we exalt also listed as a meaning of Salah, the living God who cares for us, and we offer our hearts and our cares and our fears to him. Then verse 5, happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the hard ways to Zion. That means we have surrendered those cares in the presence of God in our worship. We find our strength and our peace in the living God ready to take on our burdens if we allow them. As they go through the valley of Baca, now some say this is a real place where there are so-called weeping trees. Some commentators say this is a waterless valley one would go through on the way on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Others say it's a metaphor for going through tough times when we just have to hold on and get through knowing we will and that God is with us. After this waterless time, verse 6 says, there will be a place of springs where early rains cover it with pools. There will be a time of replenishment, not just from one form of fresh water, two. We will find renewal as we make this time, go through this time of weeping. It's a wonderful promise of God, providing hope for when we're in valleys in our lives. But we will save the rest of that for a message in a couple of weeks. Now, we've been focused a lot on Thanksgiving, gratitude lately as we lead up to Thanksgiving and head into Advent. We looked at how being grateful, focusing on God, keeps us from worrying about all the problems in this world an evil that troubles our spirits, and how it can be a form of healing. So I want to spend a little time on the connection between joy and thanksgiving and how it relates to worship, especially here in the house of the Lord with each other. Jenny Salt, a dean at Sydney Missionary and Bible College, wrote about the connection of joy and thanksgiving using Nehemiah 12, 27 to 43. She said in this scene, It shows how joy came to the people as a result of the presence of God. 
It is God-centered. And also came due to their gathering as his people, giving thanks to him. Verse 43 says, God made them rejoice. It came from him. He was the living active source of his people's joy as they worshiped. There's a good lesson for the church today. Jenny says, the difference today is that it's not really about the place, but the person of Jesus who we come to focus on and praise. It is through him we gain access in a relationship that allows God's grace to be felt as well as his joy. Second Salt said, we learn that joy comes in remembering God's faithfulness. We discussed this a a couple weeks ago in our message about remembering God's goodness. Joy comes with thankfulness. And we need this time of gathering together to remember and pause in the craziness of life. She says we are so apt to forget that we need daily preaching of the gospel to ourselves to remind us of the truths found within, and we need to hear God's word and reflect on it weekly with each other. This is the only way to allow God's ways to become our default, she says. We remember through talking with each other about our faith and God's deeds not just in scripture, but in each other's lives. As the people in Nehemiah thank God for the wall that would keep the temple safe, their place to be present with God, they responded with songs of thanksgiving. Their choirs embodied thanksgiving, she says. So how much more should we, on this side of the cross, be responding with thanksgiving? knowing that God's faithfulness and love poured out in the crucifixion and the resurrection, we should be exuding joy, she says. You don't have to tell a bride on her wedding day or a new parent looking at their baby or a kid with a bowl of ice cream to rejoice. And so it should be with us. We should be so filled with thanksgiving that joy is a natural response. That passage in Nehemiah says the women and the children also rejoiced. Everyone felt this overwhelming joy given by the Lord due to their worship. And their joy was heard far away, it says. This really got me thinking about we have got to show our joy. We need to be living into that. We heard a beautiful song titled Rejoice by the Praise Band last week. And we should live that out so that others are curious about our joy. Where does it come from? They should see our joy. And we get to know them and then share with them that our joy is not based on this world, not based on circumstances or things, that it comes from us knowing Jesus and how we are joyful due to his love for us and that it's available to them as well. We have to find ways that show that they are worthy, too, that they, too, can find joy, that their longing can be filled through Christ and the presence of the Lord. Now, many psalms speak of rejoicing and thankfulness. I could quote many of them here, but I will just share one more, Psalm 100, that discusses the link between rejoicing and thankfulness. Shout joyfully to the Lord, All the earths serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. This psalm surely knows, like our psalm today, that we come to offer praise and we get joy. Moving down to the last paragraph, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Bless his name for he is good. His kindness and faithfulness are everlasting, to paraphrase. A prayer living hope international. This psalm gives us a wonderful picture of the Israelites I'll leave it there. together with one accord, shouting joyfully to Yahweh for his kindness and protection. And we too should be grateful that we cannot help but sing for joy due to the gift of Jesus and his unfailing love and mercy. One reason we need to gather, they say, is that we have to remind ourselves 
that we are created. We belong to God as sheep belong to a shepherd, and that he will tend to our needs and our wounds, that he will guide us and keep us safe if we let him toward the righteous path to the kingdom of God as his beloved people. We gather to fix our eyes upon his steadfastness and his goodness. Once a week at least, we need to remind ourselves. Now I want to share a bit from a 2007 book I just ordered, and I'll be reading titled Believe and Rejoice by Dr. James P. Gills. I previewed the book while researching a quote from C.S. Lewis about joy, seen here on the cover, that joy is a serious business of heaven. He gives some more context to Lewis's quote, as well as the other theologians' thoughts on joy. Gill says, communion with the risen Lord is our daily joy, which is the source of our strength in all we do. When we believe and surrender to his will, we are filled with a joyful spirit. Now I know there will be times when we don't feel joyful in this world, and we'll get to that soon. But let's for now say that it's in the surrender, in our faith, that we gain the joy. Due to us receiving God's boundless love, we will have an outpouring of joy, he says. Using John 15, 11, when Jesus says, I have spoken these things so that my joy can remain in you and your joy may be full. See, Jesus wants joy for us. He promised his joy for us when we believe and receive. When we're filled with his holy affections of grace, as Jonathan Edwards puts it, life is no longer an endless search for meaning. This section in Gill's book reminded me of the video we watched a few last month from Paul David Tripp when he discussed how our drive and longing for sex and money goes against our longing and need for the only one who can truly satisfy our loving creator and Jesus. C.S. Lewis used the word sing-soaked. I might not be saying that right meaning a longing for joy, when he discusses how we humans try to fill our God-shaped hole in worldly ways. Gill says, until we have a heart full of fervent belief and worship, we will never have a joyous existence. I will say it as Jesus said it, your faith will make you well. He says, we tend to think also, When I get this done in my life, I'll be happy. When this finally occurs, then joy will come. Maybe this is part of what Jesus meant when he said those who lose their life will gain it. Meaning we find our true purpose, which is pleasing God and our relationship with him being the source of our joy. When we praise and adore God in worship, C.S. Lewis said that we find joy when we are searching for something else, and that something else is God. I had a friend send me some wonderful words from Lewis recently, a longing, and I responded, this is beautiful. What are you longing for? This gets back to our discussion at the beginning of this message in the first verse of the psalm, and as the Dear Panteth song. I think everyone, whether they know it or not, has a deep longing in their soul for God. For this joy to be found, and for hope, peace, and love as a result of faith. Gill says, we are filled with joy, which strengthen us in our daily life. For that to happen, we have to trust God and allow him to have control of our lives. We have to let Jesus take the wheel, so to speak. This joy is not something we can produce, per Gill. It happens due to his grace and his work in us. Gill says this means we realize how short life is, in a sense. Too short for anger, resentment, jealousy, and worry. It's too short not to let his joy fill our lives. In chapter 1, he says some great theological thoughts on joy by many people. He said Charles Spurgeon said that joy is peace dancing, 
and that God's peace is joy at rest. That's beautiful imagery. Although my research found that this is actually a quote from F.B. Meyer. But there is a quote I found from Spurgeon about joy, that the greatest joy of a Christian is to give joy to Christ. Now another quote from C.S. Lewis says that joy is the response or result of that felt sense of God's love. I say amen to that. It's in the surrender, Gil says, when we turn over our worries and our lives that we find joy, because then we abide in his presence. Here on Sunday and throughout the week, when we believe in his promises and trust in his care, that we can have this deep longing filled with joy. And we don't have joy, Gil says, it has us. Our joy in God is based on his delight in us. We live to please God, I guess that means, which brings us incredible joy. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you. He will quiet you by his love and exalt you with loud singing. See, it's a reciprocal relationship. We work at with God. He sings over us, exudes love, and we in return do so in praise in our worship. And we are blessed in the midst with deep joy that sustains. This brings me to us finding joy here at this church when we show up knowing the true source of our joy also enjoys our praise and worship. We join in on this reciprocal relationship with Jesus, with God, and in our spirits, where the Holy Spirit resides. Last month, Andrea asked a question during a youth message, why do we come to church? And I believe it was Sam who said, to worship. See, joy is a result of that worship. So we come to worship and we receive joy. We can relate this to my message in in this month's newsletter, being what is our purpose as a community of faith, maybe. You should be able to boast about this holy place. What is it to you that makes this church special? Someone tell me something. What makes this place special to you? Our church. People, thank you. That's the most important thing. The church is the people, right? But we do have a lovely sanctuary. And the word sanctuary is important, I think. It's a meeting place set apart for God's special purposes, for us to gather, to sing, to pray, to worship, to dedicate and to bless and enjoy. We also have a lovely fellowship area in our basement where we can chat, enjoy good food and conversation and also where we gather for Sunday school and do business and our love feast. And we have an annex where Shelley and I enjoy a lovely space to work and we're able to have it be used as an office for the Nebraska CASA organization where they can hold their board meetings, where 10,000 villages can, and where we have some meetings. And now we have some things going on in our parking lot allowing it to be a space available for the community to gather, to rest, to play, and to receive. We have our community garden, giving joy and sustenance to people, as well as insects, birds, and animals. We have our rain garden, giving life to creatures as well. Now in the Old Testament, worshipers gathered at the temple. It was a set-apart place for meeting God, quite literally, really. They saw it as needed for forgiveness and mercy of all kinds. And in Psalm 84, it depicts a Hebrew pilgrim on his way to the temple, to Zion. And during his ascent, we are given truths that are known to all God's worshipers, no matter where they are. It's not because it's a beautiful place that the people long to go to the temple. That's not why we come either. It's because God is there, the living God worthy of our praise. Even the birds find refuge 
in the rafters of the temple. Now, per, per Brian Regeer in a blog post about this psalm, we should be preparing for our time of worship on Sunday throughout the week. We should be building ourselves up toward a meeting with the presence of God. And when we leave here, we should have a sense of being launched into our week, ready to live out the truths of God word, God's word, learned in the midst of his people. We should feel renewed and strengthened due to our time of worship and fellowship together. Pastor Ray Heilman has said that Sunday morning worship is a Saturday decision. We should be prepared to, to be in worship by not staying up too late or being led, having too many weeks where we forgo worship for comfort or just make an excuse not to come. As I look back on a document Shelley does regarding our worship attendance, I notice that we have barely been making our average attendance of 30 in worship. I believe a goal for, for us should be to increase it by at least three by the end of next year. So you have to prepare, be willing, I say, to go to church on Sunday and try your best to stick to that. And it's not just for a benefit of a number on a spreadsheet or just seeing more of us here. It's good for the body and for each of us. The pilgrim, in other words, finds grace and favor in the sanctuary of the Lord. It's for our own individual good and for the good of everyone in attendance. When we need each other. We get strength and edification as we gather and as we grow in our faith as we learn from God's word and as we worship. And lastly, per Rigir, we remember as Christians that the temple has passed away. We have a new covenant, which we discussed last week. Now Jesus is the temple through which we may now approach God and also how we are God's temple and that his spirit dwells in us. That's why we find joy as we come to worship together also, I think. We're hardwired for it due to the Holy Spirit residing within. And we gain our joy, our satisfied souls replenished when we gather in the midst of God's people. So make sure you plan on coming to church. Gather as God's people to receive joy with thanksgiving and to find purpose in the court of the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your many words on joy found in the Bible. Help us to meditate on them deeply, allowing your joy to permeate our souls and for us to live into that joy so that others may see it and want to get to know Jesus as a result. Amen. Now let us stand and sing our closing hymn, You Shall Go Out With Joy, and we will sing it through two times.
Go out with joy. Sing God's praise in your heart and with your life. life.